Hello again, Salamat Pagi. Women around the world have pointed out that one of the big problems that we have with violence against women is that our societies have given permission to the violence. We've allowed the violence to continue. We give permission to the violence when we don't have good laws, when we don't train police to uphold the laws. We give permission to the violence when we celebrate the use of violence. Every morning at work, workmates and students see a woman come in with a black eye but they don't say a thing. Every day in public, people see children being hit, and they don't say a thing. Because we just say, oh, it's a personal matter. I'm not going to say anything. And what women activists around the world have been doing is saying with a very forceful voice that we as a society must speak out. We as a society must say, these are not family matters. These are not personal matters but these are matters for the whole society. These are things that concern us all. And so one of the things that we are seeing is huge changes around the world in our laws, in police practices, in services for women who are trying to escape abusive relationships. We see shelters for women all over the world developing. So that's been one big issue, violence against women. The violence is being committed by some men then what that means is that men have a responsibility to speak out against the violence. Men have all men, and we'll, I'm going to come back to this theme a bit later, but I believe that all men, even the majority of men who never use violence in our relationships with women, all of us have a responsibility to speak out. I'll talk more about that later. But it's so important that we actually reach the men who are currently using violence to stop them. So that's one reason why it's important and critical to engage men. Because some of our brothers, some of our fathers, some of our sons, and some of our friends are hitting their wives, are raping their girlfriends or their spouse, are sexually harassing women at the workplace, are emotionally bullying and controlling the women in their lives. It's also important to, to engage men in promoting women's equality. Because for the simple reason that men still have more power in our society. When you think about it, let's say we want to develop a program for women. Well, it's important that we engage men to support that for the simple reason that men run the parliaments, run the corporations, run the media. And so we have to bring those men in as allies, as supporters, because they have the, 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 the budgets. They're the ones who are still passing the laws. So it's critical. Those men are still the gatekeepers of the old system. So we have to draw men in if we're going to support women's equality. Overall, as we see, as I continue, men, of course, still have enormous power over women in society as a whole, within our different religious traditions, in the family, so if we're going to bring about a society of gender equality, then it's important that men are part of that process. Yes, women have made heroic strides, often on their own, and I celebrate the strength of women. I celebrate the power of women. But at the same time, we must say, how can we extend the, the, the work that women are doing and embrace the society as a whole? Well, those are some reasons why I'm here to talk about the importance of engaging men and boys. Because I believe that the pathway to gender equality must include men. We must bring in men as allies with women, working with women with respect, working with women in partnership. We'll talk more about that. But I think there's another reason why I believe we must engage men in these discussions. And that is, and here's a paradox which I'll be talking about, the status quo, the way we've set up the world in male-dominated societies, in many ways is very good for men, but in other ways, it's not so good for men. And I'll be talking about that. You know, when you think about it, men die younger than women. Men are more likely to be in prison than women. 
Men are more likely to commit suicide than women. Men are more likely to be addicted to alcohol or other drugs than women. All these different things. Most men aren't as happy as they could be. And so it's not only for women's benefit that I think we need to engage men, but as we will see, it is critical. It is critical that we engage men because I believe that this is going to be good for men as well. Well, if we want to engage men, let's say we all say, yes, this is a good idea. Let's engage men. How do we do it? How can we actually be successful right here in Indonesia or in any country in the world? Well, of course, many of the specific answers, how you can do it right here in Indonesia, I don't have those answers. Those are your answers. But I think that there's some general ideas that affect us all over the world that I'd like to explore. What I'd like to explore is how we, is, I'd like to explore the lives of men. I'd like to explore how we raise boys to be men. I'd like to explore how we construct masculinity. And that will give us some clues. That will give us some clues, both why some men use violence, but also it will give us some clues how we can successfully work with men and boys. It's okay so far? Good. Did, it, did everyone come to the right talk? Okay. I just thought I should check. Did, did anyone think you were coming to a talk on nuclear physics or anything? No, okay. Because I, I could talk about that too. I'm, I'm, no, I couldn't actually. So, let's think about this. What I'd like to do is explore the paradox in the lives of men. So, on the one hand, men's lives and men's experiences are shaped by the central reality of virtually all societies in the whole world. And that central reality is that virtually all our societies all over the world are what we call male-dominated or patriarchal societies. Now, the interesting thing is that for most of human history, this is not how people lived. You know, human beings probably started evolving you know, a million or two million years ago but human beings like us have been around for probably 150,000 years. People that look like us, and they don't dress like us, but like us. We, we, we've been around for 150,000 years. For most of human, that period, for most of that 150,000 years, humans lived in societies based, we think, on a high degree of equality between women and men. Now, of course, people had different jobs. You know, people lived, they didn't live long lives. So, for example, women spent quite a bit of their total lifespan either pregnant or nursing, lactating, breastfeeding for a baby. And so, yes, women and men had different jobs in different cultures. But what those people who study human societies tell us is that there wasn't a hierarchy. Men didn't have power over women, but there was equality. There was equality between women and men for tens and tens of thousands of years. Well, that began to change. It began to change probably about 8,000 years ago. Now, 8,000 years sounds like a long time, but when you consider that humans have been around for 150,000 years, 8,000 years is nothing. But for the past 8,000 years, humans have increasingly lived in male-dominated societies. Societies where men had more power than women. Anyone else like water? <laughs> uh, please, help yourself. Um, the, uh, so where men had more power than women. And these societies began to spread. They began to spread because they began to organize armies. They learned to fight. They learned to conquer other societies. And so little by little, male-dominated societies spread over the whole planet. And now there's only a few very small cultures that still are based on equality. For example, in Africa, in this, the southern part of Africa, there's a tribe of people called the uh, Kungsan, 
in the Kalahari Desert, who still live lives of high equality between women and men. Or you've seen pictures of the so-called pygmies in Central Africa, in the Congo. Um, again, they have a society based on a high degree of equality between women and men. But sadly, in most of the world now, we have societies that are male-dominated, where men control the society from the top to the bottom. Now, what does that look like? Well, because some people will say, yes, that was true in the past, but now we have much more equality than we did 20, 30, 40 years ago. Now, that's true. All over the world, we do have more equality. But we still live in a society where men have more power. This is what it looks like. We still live in a society where men make much more money than women earn. Where I live, men earn about $1.50 for every dollar that women make. In our companies, we have these glass ceilings where the, job, the more prestigious jobs are monopolized by, by men. We live in a world in which politics is still dominated by men, where men control most levels of politics. This is a picture of the North Korean parliament or whatever they call it, I don't know. A lot of men, anyway. <laughs> we live in a world where most of our political and our religious leaders and other leaders are men. Some we like, some we don't like, but our leaders tend to be men. And by the way, if you ever want to spot a male leader in the crowd, just look for the guy who's waving. They just, <laughs> they, they all love waving. Um, although your, your, your new prime minister, he doesn't wave, he does, what does he do? He, he has a hand gesture. What does he do? Does he do this? This? He did, oh, this, three things. Yeah, yeah, right. But there he is waving. He, um, anyway. Um, our male-dominated societies are ones in which we train groups of men to be soldiers, to be warriors. Not only in the ancient past in China, as you see from these, these uh, figures, but very much to this day. We train groups of men to be warriors, to be soldiers. Our male-dominated societies of the world are ones in which men control the economies of the world, don't we? And let me just say, what a fantastic job men are doing right now in controlling the economies of the world. Let's hear it for the men. You know, it's like, wow, what a mess all over the world. All over the world in male-dominated societies, our biggest sports heroes are men, the ones who we celebrate the most, we pay the most. Even when there's men and women athletes doing the same thing, we really give much more attention, much more money, more resources to what the men are doing. In a male-dominated society, most of our bosses are still men. Not always, this is changing. But still, as you go up the corporate ladder, we see more and more men in positions of power over women and over other men. And of course, a male-dominated society is one in which men are supposed to lead the way. We're supposed to be in charge. You know, within many of our families, we have this idea, it's a very strange idea, but we have this idea that there should be a head of the household. Now, have you ever thought about that concept? The head of the household. Why do we need a head of the household? Do we really need, you know, hello, I am the president of my family. <laughs> I am the CEO of my family. I am the king of my family. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Because, of course, in our families, if there is a man and a woman, you need to cooperate on decision-making. You need to cooperate on, on the work you do. You need to look after children together, all these different things. But we have this outdated idea. It's a patriarchal idea. Because the word patriarchy is a word that means control or rule of the father. And so the idea of patriarchy, of male domination, actually goes back to the family where men were seen to be in charge. And in some places in the world, in some cultures, this idea of the head of the family being a man reaches absurd proportions. I was uh, in Korea speaking a few years ago, and they told me, this is in South Korea, they told me about the law in Korea, that, there, that only a man could be the head of a household. So I said, well, what happens if the father dies? And then the son becomes the head of the household. And I said, well, what if the son is only two years old? And they say, he's the head of the household. So there's this little kid going, 
you know, and he can't even talk, and yet he's the head of the household. Why is he the head of the household? There's one reason, and it's a very small reason. He has a little tiny penis. And because of that, because of that, he's the head of the household. Now, this is absolutely crazy. But these ideas of men's power are not only out there in society as a whole, not only within our religions, not only uh, within uh, our, our economies or media or place, but right there in our personal lives where men feel that they have power. Now, so we've lived with these structures for a long time, but it's not just that the structures are out there. The way that we raise boys and girls brings those structures right into our developing brains. It's an incredible process. But when we're born, when we're born, our brains are only 10% developed. And our brains are like sponges just soaking up the surrounding world. Not only the physical, natural world, but we soak up the social environment right into our developing brains. And we do this at an incredible rate. Every single day, the newborn baby creates millions of new brain cells. Millions. And what these brain cells do is, and what this process of creation is doing, is literally taking the world, the things that you see and hear and smell, observe, and bring it right into your own developing brain. We begin a process starting from birth in which we define children, not just as a human being, but as tied to our ideas of gender. Let me tell you a story about this. And I, and I know some of you were at my workshop yesterday, and I apologize to the ones that were there yesterday. I'm going to tell a few stories again. Uh, I'll, I'll warn you when I'm going to repeat a story so you can take a little nap or something, okay? <laughs> so for those who were at my workshop yesterday, you can take a nap because I'm going to tell a story I told you yesterday. For me, when, these, I, when this became so clear to me about how early we, we start turning our sons into real men was when my son was born. Now, this was a long time ago now. He, my son is married. He has a child. I'm a grandfather. I have some pictures of my grandson. Do you want? No, no. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. I should, but I don't. Um, so here, this most wonderful moment of my life, my son was just born. So there I am in the delivery room, which is our now the norm in, 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 in North America and Europe for the man to be present for the birth. It's a wonderful thing. So there I am in the delivery room, and my son had been born for five seconds, and I didn't yet know if it was a boy or a girl. Now, you must think at this point that the speaker from Canada is really stupid if he didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. But the reason I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl is because at that moment, I had so many tears in my eyes from crying that I could not see the little thing. <laughs> and I mean, when I say the little thing, I mean the little thing on the little thing. I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl until the nurse spoke. Now imagine this. Until this moment, the nurse had been speaking in her normal voice, and suddenly her voice dropped down really deep, and she said, It's a boy. What a strong little fellow. I was totally shocked, not because it was a boy. I'd taken high school biology. I knew there was a 50-50 chance it was a boy. But I was shocked by the change in her voice, and I was shocked by what she said and how she said it. And I knew, and I knew that if it had been a girl, her voice would have gone up even higher, and she would have said, it's a girl. She's so beautiful. But it's a boy, so he's a strong little thing. My son was five seconds old, and he was being measured for his first football uniform. That's what it felt like. And this is what happens to us from the time we are born. We are held differently, played with differently, talked to differently. I remember around the time that, um, uh, that uh, my son was born, a friend had a baby, and she told me this story. Uh, let me tell you this. Does anyone have a baby I can use for a demonstration? <laughs> no. Could I use someone's bag or purse? As long as it seals up, it just has to... Oh, good. Oh, God. This is a heavy baby. Is there anything breakable in this? Or just your computer? 
Oh, your computer? Oh, no problem. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, there she is. One day she's waiting for the bus to come. She has her baby in her arms. And this day her baby is wearing uh, what we call this lumberjack outfit. You know, these guys that cut down trees? And they used to wear these red and black, sort of like that, but not shirt, but red and black check shirts. So there she was wearing this lumberjack outfit in jeans, this little baby. And this guy comes up, really nice guy, doesn't know anything about the baby, but he's a casual acquaintance. He takes the baby and says, hey, I see you had your baby. And he starts like throwing the baby up in the air. <laughs> starts throwing the baby up in the air and goes, whoa, what a strong little fellow. What's his name? And my friend says, her name is Sarah. <laughs> and he instantly goes, oh, she's so cute. Look at those jigsy weeksies with the boo boo. Now, can you imagine, since you were born, either being treated like ho or kushkamawushku, that is going to do something to your head. And the reason you can imagine this, thank you, don't throw your baby around. <laughs> the reason you can imagine it is it happened to each and every one of us. Studies show that boys and girls are held differently, talked to differently, given different clothes, of course, to wear, different toys to play with. And the importance of this is that this is how babies learn. This is not just superficial stuff. That moment of the baby being either thrown up in the air or going, doo -doo -doo -doo, actually is what is shaping that baby's brain development. Because it's not just that one 10 seconds. That's repeated over and over and over again. So think about this just as one example. What are those two different babies learning? Let me ask you, what is that boy learning when he's being tossed around? What's he learning? He's learning to be, to be strong, to be, hmm? to be rough and tough, no fear, no fear, don't cry, you know, all this stuff. What's that little girl learning? She's learning, she's soft and she's fragile and she has to be looked after. Now, she's not learning this intellectually. It's not like she's at a lecture like you are thinking, oh, she thinks, or he thinks, my gender is being constructed. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. The learning at this point is not intellectual. It's physical. It's emotional. And as a result, it's actually much deeper than intellectual learning because it's right into our bodies. I remember when I was, um, uh, when I was a, a boy about, uh, I don't know, nine, nine years old maybe, uh, uh, my friends uh, taught me how to smoke like a man. And it, it was an amazing thing because w what, what happened... Um, actually, do you want me to teach you how to smoke like a man? <laughs> stand up. Everyone stand up for a second. I'm going to teach you how to smoke like a man. Just stand up. Come on. Stand up. So, so here's what they taught me. This is amazing. This is how we learn to be men and women. They said, first of all, when you're smoking with someone, you stand sideways. So go on, stand sideways, you're smoking with me. Now you ask, why do you stand sideways? The reason, they said, was while you're distracted smoking, the other guy might attack you with a knife. <laughs> so you want to present a small target, okay? So then they said, but you don't just stand there, you have to get into the fight or flight position. <laughs> fight, flight, right? Now, if you are a real man, are you in the flight position? No. no. <laughs> You're in the fight position. So you get the weight on your front leg. Good technique. Very good. <laughs> the reason, and you know you've got the weight on your front leg because you can feel your massive rippling muscles ripple. Okay, so now they said you're ready to hold the cigarette. You don't just hold it anyway. This is, of course, North American style. They say you make a fist, and the cigarette becomes part of the fist. Like that, they said. So I was saying, okay, now do we smoke it? They said, no, not yet. Because before you smoke it, you have to give the cigarette the look. <laughs> now, the reason you give it the look is that the job of this cigarette is to kill you, right? Right? That's the job of cigarettes, kill human beings. That's their job. But if you're a real man, are you scared of death? No. So you give it the look, 
you crinkle your eyes together a bit. And then if you're really tough, you laugh in the face of death. So you go, <laughs> okay? So now you're ready to smoke it, ready? So what you do is right before you smoke it, then you look around because this is when the other guy attacks you with a knife, right? So is everyone ready? Make that fist. Get that pretend cigarette in there. Give it a look. Now look around quickly. And then, oh, by the way, when you smoke it, you don't just puff. Real men don't puff. You take this drag into your lungs, okay? So ready? <laughs> so get that cigarette. Okay, ready? Look around. One, two, three. Smoke. Oh, okay. And then they said, now you stand tall in the saddle, and then you flick away your cigarette. Okay, good. So, so this incredible process is repeated over and over and over again. Everything that we do gets defined in terms of how men are supposed to do it or how women are supposed to do it. So men learn to stand a certain way. Men learn to sit a certain way. <laughs> like that, because you have these enormous genitals, so you have to keep your legs <laughs> way open, because they're huge. So all this stuff, every day we learn to do like a man. And the reason we do it like a man is because we live in a society where we say men have power. The reality is that men have more social power, economic power, political power, religious power than women. And so the ways we raise boys to be men is to make them feel powerful, is to help them learn to be powerful in the world. When I'm not speaking about gender issues, my other job is I'm a Calvin Klein model. I just, I just want you to know that. Or of course we have these US images, you know, of the rugged man as the cowboy. You know, or these images of just the very sort of sexy, strong guy. So we're bombarded with all of these different images about what a real man is. So from the start, we raise boys to be supposedly powerful, strong, in control. And this goes on and on. But here's the thing. I've said, and I, we probably all agree in this room, that we live in a country, in a world where men have more power, right? Right? Men have more power. Can you imagine now just walking down any street in Jakarta with a microphone in your hand, like a reporter, and you're going to do man-on-the-street interviews. So you're going to go up to men, because we know all about men's power, and we're going to say, excuse me, sir, tell me about all of your power. <laughs> and he's going to look at you just like you looked at me, like, are you crazy? <laughs> I don't have power. I'm bossed around at work. I don't make enough money. I'm bossed around at home. Even my dog bosses me around. I don't have any power. And so you ask another man, tell me about your power, sir. And he again is going to look at you like, I don't have power. How do we account for this discrepancy between the very real power that men enjoy in the world and that sense that men have of not having power? And I think it's accounted for by several things. First of all, when we think about a patriarchal society, it's not only a society of the power of men over women. It's also about the power of some men over other men. So it's an intricate system of not just men over women, but some men over other men, some women over other women, some women over men even. And so it's a very intricate system of a hierarchy of power. And so it's true. At the workplace, for example, most men don't have much power. In the world of politics, in the economy, most men don't have much power. That's actually true. But they still, on average, have more power than women. And so why don't they see that? Well, for several reasons. One is when you have power, when you have privilege, it's invisible to you. You just take it as that's just the way it is. But when you actually have forms of power, have forms of privilege, you don't even see it, it's just the norm. But there's even another reason, even more profound, why when I ask men about their power, they would say, I don't have power. And that is this. Remember 
that story of the birth. From birth, we raise boys up with the idea that you will be strong. You will be powerful. You will never be scared. You will have no fear. You will have all the answers. You will get a lot of sex from a lot of women. You will make a lot of money. You will be able to drink and hold your alcohol. You will have a fancy car. You will be tough. You will be able to fight. You will be good at sports. All these endless messages. But the truth is, no man, no man can live up to those expectations. There is not a man on the planet who can live up to all those expectations. You could say, yeah, well, some may come closer. They might have, you know, the right body or be good at sports or make a lot of money. But they can't live up to all the expectations of manhood. In other words, there's this very bizarre break between our assumptions, what a real man is, and the lived reality of men, that we can't live up to these ideals of manhood. And so what kicks in at a very young age is a sense of inadequacy, a sense of not living up to what it's supposed to be. And then we, when the boy doesn't live up to that, what do we do with it? Well, we humiliate them. We humiliate boys and men who are not living up to, who are not manly enough not only in the army around the world or in police forces around the world as part of basic training, but it's day in, day out. So the little boy who falls down and cries, what do we say to him? What do we say? Hmm? Yeah, we say man up. Uh, we say big boys don't cry, act like a man, don't be a girl, all these terrible things. We tell him not to feel, not to be sensitive. And we not only tell him that, but we humiliate him. And we humiliate him in sexist language. We say, oh, you're like a girl, as if that's an insult. So we insult women and we humiliate boys. We also teach boys not to trust their feelings. Because the other thing we say to that little boy who falls down and cries is, don't cry, it didn't really hurt. Well, yes it did, that's why he's crying. But from a young age, we teach boys, don't trust your feelings. Feelings betray you. Feelings mean that you're not a real man. Well, the truth is, as human beings, we have feelings all the time. And we can't live up to these demands. And yet we have to hold them all inside. Now, this has been true for quite some time. But right now, I think, when we raise boys, it's actually becoming worse for them. It's becoming worse for them. You know, when, when, when I think about it, for example, well, I think that what we're doing is we're taking these ideas of masculinity and right now we're supersizing them. We're making them even more impossible to live up to. Let me show you some, some pictures to demonstrate that. When I was a boy in the 1950s and 1960s, yeah, I, I'm getting to be an old guy, that's true. When I was a boy in the 50s and 60s, these were my superheroes. Now, if I show those pictures to boys now, they laugh hysterically. They think those flabby middle-aged men are superheroes. <laughs> and then they look at me and they say, Michael, you're starting to look like a superhero. Um, but I want to tell you in all truth, in all truth, these were my images of invincible masculinity. Are there other men in this room who are you know, in their 50s or 60s? You remember that, right? These were, these were our images of real men. These were as tough and as strong and as powerful as you could imagine. But we couldn't live up to that. If we couldn't live up to this then, think about a boy trying to live up to this. And not only the impossible muscles, look at the difference of an expression between these sort of benign, goofy <laughs> looks and these looks, I'm going to kill you, you mother... Blah, blah, blah. Who could live up to that? Or here's another example. In, in um, the U.S., in the, um, in the 60s, there was this action figure, a soldier action figure for boys called G.I. Joe. G.I., the, the, the soldiers. That's the original G.I. Joe. And here is uh, uh, G.I. Joe uh, now. I don't know if you can see it, but much more, much more bulked. Or here's another one. You know there's a new Star Wars movie coming out? 
Everyone knows? I, I can't wait. I love, I love Star Wars. Well, here's the original Luke Skywalker action figure from uh, the 1970s. And here is Luke Skywalker today. <laughs> so we can't live up to these. You know, the video games that boys play with these, you know, t you know seeing men as these killing machines. Or as we get older, then we graduate to men's, you know, health pornography. So we have these images of what a real man is supposed to look like. Now, to some extent, these men, this is a basketball player and apparently a water polo player from Singapore, they, they do sort of look that way because they work out all day, uh, they are on special diets, maybe they do steroids or drugs, I don't know. They sort of look that way. But even then, these pictures then get photoshopped. And if you haven't seen it, when later on, Google Dove, you know, like the soap, D-O-V-E, Dove Evolution, or Dove Real Beauty. And if you haven't seen it, they have a 30-second video that takes just a normal woman and turns her into a fashion billboard. It's absolutely fantastic. Well, the same thing happens with these men. These men are photoshopped, so however close they look, it gets manipulated so they look like these images of real manhood. And so when boys and men see these images on TV, in the media, in movies, these are images that are actually manipulated images. Men actually don't look this way. And so for my trip here um, to Indonesia, I actually got a hold of the original picture on the left. Uh, do you want to see what he looks like before he's photoshopped? All right, are you sure you can take this? This is absolutely incredible. Before he was photoshopped, this is what he looks like. <laughs> We're just going to keep that picture up for the rest of the uh, presentation. <laughs> I'll, I'll give autographed copies later. No. Anyway, so we do these things. So we have these impossible images of manhood, what a man is supposed to look like. And as I say, when we can't live up to that, then we humiliate other men. We tease other men. We harass other men. We make jokes about other men not being manly enough or being gay or whatever the joke might be. But we belittle that man. So we have this very strange thing. That's what I'm talking about here. Men have power in a male-dominated society. That's absolutely true. Men have benefits from being men in a male-dominated society. And yet, at the very same time, there's a paradox. And the paradox is the ways that we have defined manhood and the ways that we raise boys to be men come with a terrible cost to men ourselves. And the cost is that we can't live up to our ideals of manhood. And so what does that mean? Well, the result has to do, leads to a number of things. The result is, for example, violence against women and violence among other men. So either a man uses, well, not either, a man will use violence in his relationships with women. Not all men, not most men, but men who do, they'll use it to have power over her, that's true, to control her, that's true, but at the same time, they're using violence because they feel insecure. They're feeling like they're not a real man. And they're feeling like they need to act like they're powerful, so they use violence. Do you hear the language that I'm using? I'm not referring to violent men. There are some violent men out there. But most men who commit rape, who hit their wives, who emotionally bully their wife, they're just men like me and the other men here, but they choose they choose to use violence against that woman to make them feel powerful, to make them feel strong, to make them feel like real men. So there's a paradox here. The violence is because men have more power, but also because men feel, I don't have power, I have to prove it. This insecurity about living up to the ideals of manhood are also the reason why men don't ask for help. One of the reasons why men die younger than women one of the reasons is men don't go to the doctor. Or if they go, they'll wait till it's too late. So they might be sick, they might have a heart problem, they might be developing cancer, but they don't get help because we think that help is a sign of weakness. Or they won't get psychological help. And remember, we humiliate the boy who shows feelings, who shows emotions, so men learn to hold it all inside. For in many cultures, men aren't good at crying. That's not, that's not because we were born that way is because for many boys they were hit when they cried. They were humiliated. And so 
men lose our ability to express feelings, to let things out, to cry, to ask a friend for a hug. There are times when all of us just need to be held and looked after. But if you're a real man, no way, you don't do that. And so what happens, all these feelings bottle up inside men. And for some men, what happens is that they turn to alcohol, they turn to suicide, or they're just unhappy, or they turn to violence. And all these things are because both this strange combination of men's power and what we can think of as men's pain. And when I say that, I want to be clear. This is not making an excuse for a man who uses violence. This is not making an excuse for that. But it is an explanation for the violence. It is an explanation for some of the abusive behavior by some men. And that's important for us to know. Could you pass this? There's a woman choking. We're going to bring this to whoever is coughing back here. Who's coughing and needs some water? I couldn't see who it is. We pass this water down to whoever. Yeah. Um, so, so in all this, I'm making a distinction. I'm making a distinction which, I don't know if there's a translation, but in English we make a distinction between sex and gender. When we talk about sex, we're talking about biology. Roughly half of us are male, roughly half of us are female. But when we talk about being a man, being a woman, when we, oh, someone else coughed, they want water too. <laughs> Just come on down. There's water here if anyone wants it. Um, we'll pass another one back. One more cough, you get another water. Um, when we talk about men and women, when we talk about masculinity and femininity, we're talking about gender. And gender is something that we create from birth. Because the thing is, when you look at human genes, not, not the genes we wear, but you know, our chromosomes. When you look at human genes, between men, males and females, there are 99 I think 0.8% the same. We have this expression, at least in English, we talk about the opposite sex. We're not opposite. There's some popular stupid books about men and women from different planets. You know, men are from Mars, <laughs> women are from Venus. It's all total crap because we're not from different planets. Our bodies are mainly the same. But what happens is that we undergo a transformation from birth. Because gender is not just an idea in our head, it actually changes our brains to some extent. We learn to be men and women, and it changes how we walk, how we stand, how we smoke that cigarette. And so all this is partly why change is so difficult, because it goes right into our brains. It goes right into our brains. Okay. So what do we do with it? How do we bring about change? Well, I want, are we, everyone doing okay? I'm going to talk for just a little bit longer, and then we're going to have questions and comments, and then I'll finish my speech at the very end. Um, in, you know, well, we have, a, we have a while yet. Um, so let's think about some of the things we can do to bring about change. And there's wonderful things happening all over the world. I mean, right now, I just, uh, during the warm-up, and I think they're going to be playing uh, a, a rock band called Sisters in Danger. Are, are you going to be playing afterwards? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, hmm? Oh, right. Okay, well, one more reason for me to finish. I mean, oh, oh, um, <laughs> they're, they're much better than me. I, I assure you, I heard them playing. So a wonderful uh, band that goes around to schools. Uh, that not, not just both performs, but talks to young people, to students, about problems of violence against women, problems of sexism. And these are young men who are doing this. Um, and so all over the world we see groups of men or groups of men and women who are working together to figure out ways that we can reach men and boys to promote gender equality, to stop sexism, and to promote healthier lives for men as well. Remember the paradox. We're challenging men's power, yes. We're challenging men's abuse, yes. But we also have to reshape what it means to be a man. So here's some of the areas that we're doing it. First of all, one of the main areas we're doing it is in relation to ending men's violence against women. And remember when I say this, I want to be very clear. Most men in most countries do not use violence in their relationships. 
but a significant minority do. And so three of us, uh, back in 1991, started a campaign in Canada called the White Ribbon Campaign. It very quickly spread across Canada, and it spread across Canada because of the impact of women's organizing for many years, but also because we had this incredible tragedy in Canada where a whole number of women were murdered by a man who basically hated women. And this galvanized our country. Well, now, you know, 20 some years later, White Ribbon has spread to 70 or 80 countries around the world. I want to show you some pictures about what that looks like and about the basic ideas of White Ribbon. So when we talk about White Ribbon and the ribbon itself, when I wear a white ribbon, and I, once again, I did not bring a white ribbon to wear, but this is how easy it is to start a white ribbon campaign. Does anyone have any tape? Um, do we have any tape anywhere at the back? Anyway, we, we may or may not, but anyway, there's, I just made a white ribbon out of paper, and if I had some tape, I would tape it on. Um, so when I wear a white ribbon, or if I put up a white ribbon poster, or have a white ribbon campaign, I'm not doing it to say to you, look what a good guy I am, but I'm wearing this as a public promise. This is a promise I'm making, it's a pledge not to commit, condone, or remain silent about violence against women. That's what it is, it's a pledge. It's also a call on governments to support women's organizing, women's groups, women's shelters, to pass good laws, to make sure that our police forces are trained in ways to implement those laws. And so our campaign, White Ribbon, I say our campaign, but it's very different all over the world. In different countries, it looks different. So for example, in Brazil, the biggest thing that happens in Brazil every year is when they're not winning the World Cup, is when, or trying to win, is their carnival parade. So at White Ribbon, they go to the carnival. In some countries, they use traditional forms of organizing, like in Namib Namibia, in Southwest Africa, where these men were rallying outside of their parliament building to support a new law on, uh, on violence against women. In Lebanon, just a straight display to get people to stop and talk. In Pakistan, this is a wrestling match, um, a traditional form of wrestling, and they just thought, let's get some men together and we're gonna turn it into an education event. Um, just a candlelight vigil in Pakistan. In China, these men signing a public pledge not to commit, condone, or remain silent about violence against women. Do you see the pattern of what White Ribbon looks like? And the pattern is there's no pattern. Because when we started the White Ribbon campaign, we decided it should be a decentralized campaign with no membership, no dues, no permission. If you want to start a White Ribbon campaign in Indonesia, you just start it. You get some people together, you say, we're going to do this. And the reason why we decided that is that we felt very strongly that people know best in their own community how to reach the men and the boys. You don't meet, you, you know, I can tell you, I can talk for hours, but I could not tell you the best way to reach men in Indonesia. Right? I'm not an expert in Indonesia, you are. So the idea of White Ribbon is that you know best how to reach the men and boys here. And that's why it's a decentralized campaign where it looks different all over the world. This is my favorite white ribbon picture. And, and, and let me tell you about this picture. We know that all over the world, boys who grow up in homes where they see their dad using violence against their mother, those boys are more likely to grow up and use violence themselves. It's not, not all of them do, but it's more likely that they will. Well, this is a story about one of them. One day in, the city, in, in his city in Cambodia, this little boy saw people giving out white ribbons. And he was a curious little boy, and he said, what's that? And he started, except for in Cambodian. And, um, and he started to explain to him about the problem of violence against women. And he interrupted, he said, oh, you don't have to tell me about that because my dad beats up my mom. And then, instead of then growing up to be a person that repeated that, he said, can I help? So here he is, he's just given this white ribbon to this street vendor who's looking at this white ribbon saying, what is this? And this little boy is explaining to him about the problem of violence against women and why it's important that all men speak out against the violence. You know, if the idea of white ribbon, whether in Mongolia or this woman who's giving ribbons out to police officers in Guatemala or these actors in China, 
or these very different groups of men in, um, uh, in New Zealand. This little boy here, you see him? The, he's standing in front of motorcycles. Because in New Zealand, every year, the White Ribbon Campaign has this cross-New Zealand motorcycle ride. And when I say motorcycle ride, the men doing it are former gang members. These are scary-looking guys. Um, and they roar into town on their big motorcycles, you know, leather and you know, tattoos and greasy hair. And they roar into town, and they get off their motorcycles. And very carefully, some of the men come out to you know, ask them about their motorcycles. And instead of talking about motorcycles, these gang, former gang members talk about the problem of violence against women. And this little boy was at one of their, one of their uh, visits. Different armies and armed forces around the world, like in Australia, have been part of this. Or just citizens, like in South Africa. Uh, just ordinary men, like in Nepal. This, these young men in Darfur. This man in a new organization in Canada called Muslims for White Ribbon, signing a pledge saying that he wants, he's one of the people who wants to put an end to violence against women. Also in Canada, these are pictures that were, posters that were done by our native peoples, our indigenous or aboriginal or Indians. And they wore their traditional clothes and they talked about having the courage to speak up. I choose a good life. This man saying, I admire her strength. Here's the first thing I talked about, how, we're going to talk about how to engage men. What we know from research all over the world is that if we're going to reach men, if we're going to reach boys, the most effective way to do that is with positive messages. You know, in Indonesia and in Canada, we have these companies, these public relations firms who are professionals at doing advertisements, right? They're really good at their jobs. But I can tell you, if you went to any advertising agency in the whole world and said, would you make us a poster about violence against women? I can tell you, I can predict what the poster will look like. It's going to be a picture of a woman with a black eye. I've seen them in every country in the world. I've seen the TV ads in every country in the world. Some of them are, are good, but we know that they're not that effective in bringing about change. But what we know from evaluations actually reaches men, reaches boys, are positive images of men speaking out against violence, of men, you know, this one says in Italian, real men don't hit. Or these posters, this poster from the US, men want to be strong? Well, let's redefine what strength is. Our strength is not for hurting. So when guys disrespect women, we say that's not right. A lot of countries use sports images. So in all these, what White Ribbon does and what many other efforts around the world do is they take a positive approach. They don't just wag a finger and, you know, at, at men. But they say, as men, we care about the women in our lives. We, care, we want our sisters and our mothers, our daughters, our wives, our friends to be, live in a world free of violence against women. And as men, we've got to speak out in order to make that happen. So it's a very positive message. It's a moving forward message, and I really like that. But because it's a decentralized campaign, it means that it really believes that people know best, not only in their own country, but in their own schools, in their own workplaces, in their own mosques, how to reach the men around them. Let me tell you a wonderful story about this. I was giving a lecture in a, a, a small town in, in Canada, a really small town. Um, and at the end of the lecture, you know, it was a smaller group than this. It was in the basement of some place. And at the end of it, um, you know, a few people were waiting to, to talk to me. And I noticed at the very back of the room, there was a man standing there looking guilty. And I thought, oh no, he's, he's got some terrible secret to tell me. And it just happened that I was very tired this day and I really wanted to go home and, and sleep. But I knew that he needed to talk to me. So finally, everyone left except for him. He came up to me. He didn't meet my eyes. And he said, um, I was expecting a horrible secret. He said, um, is it okay if people make copies of white ribbon material? Oh, I was so relieved. I said, of course you can make, ah, oh, there's my white ribbon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, he's a father of f four, three? Four, a single parent, fantastic. We'll talk about fatherhood in one minute. I'm going to tell the story first. Um, so anyway, I thought he had a terrible secret, but he said, can we make copies of white ribbon material? 
I thought he meant, you know, we had some posters and some flyers. I thought he meant just, you know, make copies of those. I said, yeah, you want to copy our posters or flyers? Sure. He still didn't look at me. He said, could we make a copy of your video? This was 20 years ago. That's still videos. Do you, do you remember videos? <laughs> no. You do. He does. She does. No, anyway. It, Anyway, video. So it was a video. So he said, could I make it? Because we had this 30-second ad that was on TV. He said, what about making copies of your video? I said, oh, of course you can make a copy. He still didn't look at me. I was thinking, is this guy crazy? I mean, what's happening here? Then he said, can I make more than one copy of the video? I said, yes, make all the copies you want. And finally, he went, oh, shoo. And he looked at me and smiled. And I said, why? He said, well, I've actually made dozens and dozens and dozens of copies. I said, oh, that's nice. What do you do with all of them? And he said, this is what I do. He said, my job is I'm a repairman. I fix VCRs, video cassette machines. And every time I fix a VCR, I put a cassette in with this white ribbon ad. I don't tell the person that there's a cassette in. I give it back, and of course, it's the man who hooks it up in his living room. He turns on his VCR and his TV, and there in his living room is a message about ending violence against women. Now, now can you imagine if we were to say, let's come up with some good strategies to reach the men in Jakarta? I don't think anyone here is going to say, I've got it. Let's organize the DVD repairman. <laughs> but if we say, you know best how to reach the men in your workplace, you know best how to reach the men in your school, you know best how to reach the men in your mosque, we know, you know best how to reach the men in your neighborhood, people are going to come up with a million good ideas. So this is not just for White Ribbon, but for all of our different work. It's really important that we work where we are. Yes, we want the government to do things, but it's really important that we do creative and positive things. Now, of course, around the world, we see many different organi organizations doing good things. Um, I, one of the things that I have the privilege of doing is I, I've been working with different police forces in different countries, just seeing amazing things. Uh, when I met with some colleagues from Turkey, they told me about their, their program of police training. And this is how they did it. They started with 30 police officers, fairly senior, and they did a training program with them about violence against women, the roles of police officers, how they should intervene. Do you know how long this training program lasted? A year. It was an incredible, in-depth program. At the end of the year, those 30 officers went and they trained another 100 officers, and they trained another 1,000. And after, at the end of two or three years, they had trained 30,000 police officers in Turkey. So some incredible things emerging around the world. Similarly, uh, our colleagues in different countries have been working closely with religious officials. Our colleagues in Pakistan, for example, decided that they, sh they should turn to imams and other religious leaders to ask them about the problem of violence against women. Ask what the Quran says about women and violence against women. And at the end of this, this was interesting because they were, our, our colleagues there were actually criticized because the, the people they invited included some people that were seen as very conservative. One of them was even an imam that the Taliban always loves and quotes as being you know, their, their inspiration. Well, this particular imam at the end of this process issued a fatwa and you could, you know, if you could understand Urdu, you could look at it on YouTube, where he speaks out, he has this long video, speaking out against violence against women. And he calls on all Muslim men to end violence against women. So it's very important that we, that, that we work within our diverse communities. So that's the first thing. Positive approaches, working in diverse communities, creating broad partnerships. The other thing with White Ribbon and many other efforts is that they are nonpartisan. They work with men right across the political spectrum, right across the religious spectrum, right across the social spectrum. And they say, we don't have to agree on many different things. In fact, we can disagree on many things. But let's work together with agreement on one thing. And the one thing is that we must work to end violence against women. And other things we'll disagree with. Okay? So the idea of working together for common cause is important. Another area 
where there's been a lot of exciting work being done in recent years is work um, to uh, uh, really change fatherhood, to change our ideas and our institutions of what it means to be a father. As you heard in the introduction, uh, the sponsor of my visit here and through other organizations is Laki Laki Puduli, or MenCare, which is an international network, um, in some ways similar to White Ribbon, but more structured. But it's an international network with the modest goal, the very modest goal, of men doing 50%, one half of the care work on the planet. Now, when you think about it, Traditionally, we've had two different ideas of what a father looks like. Well, more than two, but I'll start with two. Let me show you a couple pictures from the uh, North American media. The first image of the father comes from a TV show from the US from the 1960s. And it was a show called Father Knows Best. So the father is perfect. He knows everything. He's perfect. And the mother and the children are like, you know, planets orbiting the sun. So we have these idealized, impossible images of the perfect father. And then we also have images like this, <laughs> of the father as just being totally incompetent. You know, how many times have you seen an image in a movie where a man is given a baby and they hold it like this? Right? You've seen that image. Because supposedly men can't even hold a baby. You know, so these images, or we have these very strong images, in, again, in different cultures, of men are the disciplinarians, are the punishers. Uh, you know, boy, children being told at home, wait till your father comes home. So, you know, these ideas that men are somehow bad. They're the bad guys. What men care, Lucky Lucky Paduli, are doing is working to transform fatherhood. So men are caring for our babies, caring for our children, whether they're healthy or they're at a hospital, like this little boy in Afghanistan, uh, that we're changing to babies' diapers and, and, and looking after them. We're reading to them. The truth is that there's only two jobs when it comes to parenting that men are not good at. The first is we're really, really not good at getting pregnant. Just <laughs> terrible. And the second is that we suck at breastfeeding. We just cannot do it. But I can tell you, every other job when it comes to parenting, I believe that men can do just as well as women. Now, we can do, but we haven't had much training. You know, when my sisters were playing with a, you know, a, 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 a doll, a piece of plastic, I was out with my friends, you know, with pretend guns shooting each other. So girls and women have had a lot of practice looking after babies, looking after younger brothers and sisters. It's true, men and boys usually haven't had as much practice. So we have to learn. But I believe that men can have just as much empathy. Empathy is when you feel what someone else feels. And we need empathy to look after a baby because they can't talk. I believe that men have as much capacity for empathy. We can learn the skills of looking after babies. And not just, you know, the pretty pictures like these, but just the hard day-in, day-out work of being a parent. This man in South Asia, this is an incredible story, his wife died giving birth. And the baby was born, and the hospital came to take the baby away. And he said, why are you taking my baby away? And he said, well, it needs a woman to look after it. And he said, no, it doesn't. I'm going to look after my baby. And here he is driving a bicycle rickshaw, with his little baby in, in arms. Or here's another picture. We're, we're used to seeing very glamorous pictures from the US. Here's another US picture. Um, this is what looking after children looks like. It's not always pretty, and it's hard work, uh, but this is the work that we need to be doing as men. Uh, and of course, when we do it, we feel enormous joy and happiness. Not all the time, because it is hard work, as it is exhausting. Kids can be absolutely miserable. It's all true. Young babies, you don't sleep for a year or two or three. It's absolutely, if anyone here is thinking of having a baby, don't do it. It's terrible. No, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it, it's very hard, of course. But in the end, of course, it brings us great joy because it reaffirms us as human beings. Now, here's the thing. You would think, though, if I were to go around and talk to men and say to men, men, I want you to do half of the care work. I want you to do half the jobs 
of changing the nappies, cooking for the, your children, holding them when they're crying, when they're tired. I want you to do half of the housework because we have to do the housework to run a family. I want you to do half of the cooking and half of the cleaning. You would think that most men would say, you're crazy, why would I want to do all that? But here's what we know. First of all, we know that when we transform fatherhood, when, we, when men do more of the caregiving work, several things happen. First of all, it's good for women. It's good for women because if men are doing our share, not just helping, but doing our share of the parenting work, then it means that women can pursue their jobs. It means that women can pursue their education. And that's not only good for them, but it's obviously good for their family because they can earn more money, they can be happier, all those different things. So this is good for women. When men are looking after children, then it's not only the woman who takes a day off work because a child is sick, but those jobs are shared. And as soon as those jobs are shared, then it puts more pressure on our workplaces, on our companies, on our businesses to say, oh, we've got to understand that many of our workers are parents, so we have to figure out how to organize work to meet their needs. So this is good for, ch for women. We also know from research around the world that this is good for children. In families where there is a man, uh, where there's a man as well as a woman active, and I'm not saying that all families have to have a man and a woman, there's going to be separated families, divorced families, families where one partner has died and so forth, families, you know, different forms. But what I'm saying is that studies show that when there is a man who's playing that role in children's lives, children develop better. They are happier, they do better in school, they appear to be smarter, they're better adjusted, and that's partly because they just get more attention. They're getting attention of two people, or four rather than one or two. They're getting more attention, more support. And boys grow up with a model that men can be caregivers. Men can be nurturers. So, okay, it's good for women, it's good for children, but what about men? Are we just saying to men, sacrifice yourself because it's good for women, it's good for children? What about men? Well, there's been studies in a couple of countries. Oh, by the way, also, it's also good for women and children because studies show that men who, playing, who play more of an equal role in raising children are less likely to use violence. They're less likely to hit their spouse or to be emotionally abusive. So it's obviously good for them. But what about men? Well, here's what we know now from the studies. Uh, more than one study that has compared men who do little or no childcare and housework, comparing them to men who do an equal amount or near equal amount of childcare and housework. Here's what they discovered. The men who do more housework and childcare are healthier, they miss fewer days of work, they're less likely to be on prescription medication. They are more likely, though, if they do need help, to get help. They say that they are happier. They appear, as I said, to be in, in better health. They sleep better. It, the, the research shows that they, it appears that they're living longer. And if all those things don't convince men, the research also shows that men who do an equal share of the housework and childcare have sex more often. So if everything else doesn't convince men, you get to have sex more often. So that sounds pretty good to me. So again, when it comes to uh, fatherhood, we're seeing some wonderful, some wonderful changes. One of the things that overall that we need to do is really change the ways that we raise boys to be men. And that means a number of different things. How many of you have children? A number of you, okay. How many of you have a boy? Okay, a number of you have a boy, great. Um, how many of you at one point in your life were children? This is a trick question, just to see if you're still awake. You were a child at one point, yes. He's the old, two of you understood that question. Yes, we were all children. That was just, you know, just, anyway. So here's the thing about raising boys and girls that I believe. I believe that we have to raise boys and girls equally. I believe that boys and girls should have the same jobs at the home. And the reason is very simple. We want our boys and girls to be strong and independent. We know that, you know, that um, more and more uh, boys and girls, when they grow up, are going to have to take responsibility for a whole range of jobs. So when I raised my son, I wanted him to be able to cook. 
I wanted him to be able to sew. I wanted him to be able to clean because I wanted him to be independent and to be able to look after himself. But similarly, I have a daughter, not biological, but a stepdaughter. I wanted my daughter to also be independent. So I wanted her to teach her those outdoor jobs to fix up things around the house. I wanted her to know how to change an electric plug. I wanted her to be able to do those jobs that we think of as men's jobs because I wanted her to also be strong and independent. So it's really important, it's really important that we do jobs equally. It's not only that we assign jobs equally, but we have to model that. So if our children just see, oh, the woman does all the cooking and cleaning and the man does whatever else, they're gonna assume that's how it should be. So we have to work hard as parents to model the change we wanna be. And let's be honest, that, it can be very hard to do. Because as adults, we're sort of comfortable with certain things, uncomfortable with certain things. But we have to really question how we do things. But again, there's wonderful changes going on with raising boys differently. With helping boys develop a language of emotions. Encouraging boys to talk about what they're feeling. Not humiliating them when they're crying or sad. But encouraging them to express it. That's also really important.